Good morning, dear students. Welcome to teaching learning session of sociology. Today we will discuss block one, unit three and four of BSOE one forty four. Today's um, topic is classical ethnography and Indian ethnography. In our uh, previous lecture, we discussed about what is ethnography. Understanding and defining ethnography, classical ethnography. In most comprehensive understanding of ethnography, both in terms of definition and its method is outlined by Levi Strauss. So it was Levi Strauss who, um, uh, who has given the definition and he has outlined the definition and methods of ethnography. According to Levi Strauss, ethnography corresponds to the first stages in research, that is observation and description and field work. So ethnography involves observing the group under study, describing what researcher has observed from the point of view of the subject under study and it involved an extensive field work. The researcher tries to become a part of the group under study. He tries to understand the custom and culture of the group by the view of that group and then he interprets and write the monograph what he has observed. The typical ethnographical study consists of a monograph dealing with social group small enough for the authors to be able to collect most of his material by personal observation. Personal observation plays an important role in ethnographical study. The group should be small enough so that the researcher can observe them closely without any help. Through observation method, he tried to understand the reasons, the culture, the values of that particular group. Ethnography includes the methods and techniques connected with the field work, with the classification, description and analysis of a particular cultural phenomenon. So uh, this is of, this is related to field work, ethnography, ethnography and anthropology, anthropology, they are intermingled subjects. So ethnography includes the field work. Within the field work, the researcher classifies, the researcher observes the group, he describes and then analyze a particular cultural phenomenon and produces the a monograph. So uh, in this, the ethnography, the researcher uh, presents the point of view of the group under study. He analyzes any culture from the point of view of the group under study or subject under study instead of uh, instead of interpret interpreting um, by applying his own thoughts or own values, he uh, implements the values of the other. He uh, try to explain certain phenomenon or the cultural phenomenon uh, from the point of view of the group. According to Hammersley, for most anthropologists from the early 20th century, ethnography involved actually living in communities of a people being studied more or less round the clock participating in their activities to one degree or another as well as interviewing them collecting data drawing maps 
of the locale and collecting artifacts and so on. So uh, in this, according to Emerson, in this, the researcher become the part of that group. He, tr uh, he uh, tries to learn and understand the language, the dialect of that group. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, then he uh, then he participates in the activities of the group and he tries to collect the data through interview method to observation and he draws the map of the locale and collecting collects the artifacts to study the culture or the phenomenon of a particular group classical ethnography key sign points Ethnography is a methodology. Participant observation is a method of this methodology. And field work refers to the period of primary data collection that is conducted out of the office. So ethnography, what is ethnography? Actually, it is a methodology. And in this methodology, uh, we use the participant observation method. And this ethnography is a field work type of a research. Field work type of a research mm. means that the primary data has been collected by the researcher um, uh, going out of the office. That is, he collects the primary data from the field. Actually, he surveys that field, he observes, and then he collects the data. It is not an armchair type of a research. You cannot conduct a field research through the office. So it is out of the office type of a research. Argonauts of Western Pacific by B. Melino Whiskey. He, he, uh, this, this, Work of Malinowski is very important. He published this work in 1922. And this work is considered to be not only the classic text in anthropology, but also the foundation on which Troika of Ethnography, that is the field work, participant observation, and learning of the local or native language dialect by the ethnographer have been formulated. So this is one of the important texts of the important work of anthropology. And, uh, this, and this work is considered as the foundation of ethnography. That is, uh, Malinowski conducted, for the first time, the Malinowski conducted the field work. He, uh, he uh, adopted the participative observation method and he, uh, to uh, understand the culture of the natives, he learned the local language and dialect and then he became the part of that group and tried to understand their culture and through this the uh, ethnographer have been formulated this is one of the important work argonauts of western pacific by b melino whiskey two years long term intensive field work in 1915 16 and 17 18 in trobrian island reconfigure the anthropological research method. Malino Whiskey studied the culture of the people of Trobrian Island and to understand their culture, he did the field work uh, two years long intensive field work from 1915 to 16 and then 17 to 18. He, uh, he was fascinated by the kula, which he saw as a circulating exchange or trading system of a valuables, wherein the primitive native people stripped the commodities of its materialistic values and treated it as a symbol of exchange, fostering kinship and a group ties. While he was on the on this uh, Trobrian island and he was uh, studying the culture, he was trying to understand the culture of the people of this island, 
uh, he observed a, a tradition of a known as a Kular tradition. In this Kular tradition, what is this Kular tradition? This is Kular tradition is this circulating or um, uh, exchange or trading. It is a type of exchange or trading of system of valuables in which the people strike the commodities of the materialistic values and uh, it is treated as a symbol of exchange of fostering kinship and a group ties where people exchange their valuables to uh, maintain a relationship to uh, 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 for fostering the kinship and the group ties this uh, he was very impressed with this kular tradition which he observed while he was uh, doing his work on the uh, uh, Trobrand Island, and he uh, described about this in his uh, in his work that is the Argonaut of Pacific of Western Pacific. Elaborating upon the basics of ethnographic research, the three foundation stones of field work, Malinovsky stated, according to Malinovsky, there are the three uh, basic uh, foundation stones of ethnographic research. First is the student must possess real scientific aims and know the values and criteria of modern ethnography. So it should be uh, this ethnography work should be conducted scientifically students should be should have a scientific aim and know the values and the criteria of modern ethnography next is to live uh, without other white men right among the natives that is to uh, carry out the study or for ethnography research, the researcher should be able to live with the natives or to live with the people or the group under study without his or her own people. So should be able to survive anywhere with any of the group under study. And the third is he has to apply a number of special methods of collecting, manipulating, and fixing his evidences. So it depends on the researcher that how he or she will collect the data, how he or she will analyze that data, and uh, fixing of his evidences. So, uh, so he should be he should be aware of the methods available or should have a special methods for collecting manipulating and fixing the data the, so the three basic foundation stones according to melinovsky to carry out ethnographic study is that students should have a specific scientific aims should be able to live with the native group under study and the so finally, the third is that should have should be able to collect, manipulate, and describe the data. Should uh, know about the methods and should have the methods. Right. The next important work, ethnographical work, is done by the A. R. Radcliffe Brown um, in 1922, and this work is known as the Andaman Islanders. The Andaman Islanders, a study in social anthropology that is done by A. R. Redcliffe Brown in 1922, was a result of anthropological research carried out in Andaman Islands during the year 1906 to 1908. So as to understand the social institutions of tribes of great <coughs> Underman. A. R. Redcliffe Brown carried out these studies in from 1906 to 8 uh, in Andaman Islands uh, and uh, he tried to understand the social institutions of the tribes, how the social institution of the tribes work uh, of the great Andaman and this uh, study was published in 1922, the Andaman Islanders. In the process of this study, Radcliffe Brown looked into the interrogative, fun uh, I'm sorry, integrative function of the institution and 
while studying the social organization of the tribes social organization he outlined two main division termed as the great andaman group and the little andaman group having their own distinctive elements uh, while he was uh, studying about the social structure of the uh, tribes uh, uh, he looked into the in uh, integrative function of the institutions he wanted to find out how these institutions are integrated what is the integrative functions of this institution right uh, uh, he outlined uh, while he was doing this he outlined uh, the two main divisions that is the great andaman group uh, and the little andaman group and they have their own distinctive elements so uh, he observed that there are two groups the great andaman group and the little andaman group and they have their distinct function uh, for him living as he must in uh, for him living as he must in daily contact with the people he is studying the field ethnologist come gradually to understand them if we if we may you have has to use the term the better the observer the more accurate will be his general impression of the mental peculiarities of the race so according again according to the red cliff brown as melanie whiskey said that is important the, it is important one of the main foundation stone that the researcher should be able to live with the smaller group then according to the red cliff brown uh, that uh, researcher should be able to live uh, with the natives under study or the group under study and while they uh, live with the group under study they can observe that group more accurately and uh, will uh, gain the more uh, general picture of the mental peculiarities impression of the mental peculiarities of that specific race what they observe what they do and why they do something right the next important study uh, carried out by the margaret mead that is coming of age of samoa in 1928 a psychological study of primitive youth for western civilization by margaret mead attempted to answer this study attempted to answer the questions like what the difficulties like a rebellion against the authorities philosophical uh, perplexities the flowering of idealism conflict and struggle ascribed to the period of physical development due to being adolescent or being adolescent in america so margaret mead was actually a psychologist and uh, this study of margaret mead that is coming to the age of samoa he tried to uh, she tried to um, answer the questions uh, like uh, the difficulties faced by the uh, uh, especially the adolescents that is when they become rebellious against the authorities uh, that is conflicts and struggle uh, of that period he uh, tried this study try to uh, answer these question uh, in the course of her investigative and ethnographic explorations attempting to underline a unique cultural pattern meet tried to present to the reader the samoan girl in her social setting to describe the course of her life from birth until death she tried that the meet tried to uh, understand the uh, maybe try to answer the questions like the struggle that is the rebellious behavior of the adolescents the struggle and the conflicts and the idealism then he uh, then she studied uh, this um, uh, samoa um, people and uh, in her course of investigative and ethnographic exploration uh, she actually uh, found that the unique cultural pattern uh, matters a lot and meet tried to present 
द रीडर ऑफ समवन गर्ल इन हर सोशल सेटिंग to describe the course for her life from birth until death and uh, then she she studied about this someone girl from birth till death and according to me the culture plays an important role how the cultural uh, how the cultural impacts uh, the girl of of uh, the girl of some uh, someone community and he, he, according to uh, me the culture impacts anyone from life till death indian ethnography ethnography uses the method of first hand written descriptions of the different cultures yes it is the first hand written description because the researcher observes the culture and then he writes about or describes about that culture so it is the first hand written descriptions of the different culture it pull together all the scattered pieces of data into a common thread and present it as a whole it is essentially a comparative study which looks at the question about human existence from the point of view of a specific society and the cultural system that exists within it there are three critical questions that constantly reoccur when talking about ethnography in context of self and others the first question is how do we know what do we know and how do we assume to speak for someone else finally who is being addressed to so ethnography actually uh, 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 talks about the context of self and others and it answers uh, there are the three critical uh, question that is how do we know and what we know how do we assume to speak for someone else how can we speak for someone else how can we describe someone else and finally who is it being addressed to so these are the critical questions modern anthropology of india <clears throat> as we all know that anthropology and ethnography is they are intermingled the uh, ethnography originated from the anthropology because uh, the anthropology is based on the field work and ethnography uh, is uh, is also based on the field work the idea of modern secular india has its origin in the second half of 19th century there are three major areas which influenced the emergence of anthropology of india the first of these were the colonial attempts by the british india to understand the historic historical and ethnographic knowledge so that they can rule india easily or in a better way so the first uh, uh, the three uh, the three areas or uh, the three major, major areas which influenced the emergence of uh, anthropology in india the first was during the british era british era uh, that is the britishers try to understand the historical and the ethnographical knowledge about the india so that they can rule indians in a better way and second is a lot of societies and uh, journals were founded and materials were displayed in the museum this was also a way in which the subject was able to enter as well as make a mark for itself in university setup so second way was the uh, was the uh, uh, adoption of this anthropology by the universities of through the formation of various societies and public publications of the various journals and third is the movement for the independent india was also a reaction to the increasing control uh, that colonial rule was exerting on the indian state and the anthropology was one of the ways in which 
this was done before independence the anthropological work in india was majorly descriptive and encyclopedic in nature and the idea was creation of image of india uh, that was seen as an exotic culture that needed to be explored and discovered so uh, before independence in the first era that is during the british period the, um, the anthropological uh, work of india is basic or uh, is basically of descriptive type is basically of encyclopedic type in which the in which uh, the the idea of this work was to uh, create an uh, image of the india and um, it was seen that indian that the indian culture is an exotic type of a culture that is needed to be explored and uh, discovered it was only a few decades before the independence around 1920s and 30s that the discipline that of anthropology was able to break free from the administrative change and the studies took place in india now looked at the understanding of india from a different perspective so uh, in 1920s and 13 that was the second era um, that is the second era of anthropology in this era uh, this uh, uh, anthropological studies uh, now started looking the india as a place to understand the india from the different perspective rather than an exotic culture and uh, post 1947 that is after independence the discipline of modern anthropology developed as a separated field wherein not just within the country but also at the global level it went through numerous changes with regards to its discourse methodology and conceptual understanding so actually in india there are the three phases of anthropology that is uh, during british era the second is from 20s 1920s to the 30s and that and now, third one is a uh, post independence that is after independence right uh, in british era it was basically concerned about the study about the exotic culture of the indian it was a descriptive type of a research the second is uh, the anthropology makes its its way into the universities and in 1947 post independent india there was change in the uh, uh, discourse in the methodology and the conceptual understanding of the anthropology right the Indian anthropology post independence stated to get influenced by the international debates in anthropology and had discussion on the social and the symbolic values, on ideas and values, and on ideas of resistance, as well as on the concept of post colonialism. So uh, after uh, post post in, uh, independent India, uh, it was the uh, Indian anthropology was influenced by the international uh, debates. In the years that followed independence, anthropologists conducted detailed ethnographic research in all parts of the country even though not equal attention has been accorded to the different parts of the country. But again, uh, this the anthropologist started conducting the ethnographic researches in India after independence. And uh, various anthropologists contributed a lot to the Indian anthropologist the in context of India, there are seven eminent Indian scholars who can be mentioned or whose work have been instrumental to the birth and development of anthropology in India. So seven scholars contributed a lot in the development of anthropology in India and those scholars are S.C. Roy, G.S. Ghure, N.K. Bose, D.N. Majumdar, L.R. Vidyarthi, Sujit Sinha, 
and S.C. Dubey. These seven scholars played an important role in Indian anthropology. S.C. Roy, G.S. Gure, N.K. Bose, D.N. Majumdar, L.R. Vidyarthi, Surjit Sinha, and S.C. Dubey. S.C. Roy made the first attempt in 1921 to provide a bibliographical account of publication on the tribes and caste till that time, which was present in published magazines, compilation of handbook and monographs on the tribe. So the first attempt was made by the uh, S.C. Roy in 1921 and he studied about the tribes. He published a monograph on the tribes. Second is D.N. Majumdar. D.N. Majumdar made an attempt similar to S.C. Roy in 1946 when he reviewed how anthropology had developed so far and how the condition of the study was under the British administration. Next is G.S. Gure. G.S. Gure is known as the father of Indian sociology. G.S. Gure, in his article, The Teaching of Sociology, Social uh, Psychology and Social Anthropology in 1956, mentioned how India had not managed to keep pace with the development that was happening in Europe and America. And while the British influence was still present, the understanding of American social anthropology was completely missing. So he tried to explain uh, how um, the India was not able to keep peace with the development of what is happening in Europe and America and how uh, Britishers influenced us. Then S.C. Dubé discussed a similar issue in 1962. He highlighted the need for more refined techniques of methodology and research for Indian social anthropology. In 1963, N.K. Bose came up with the booklet, 50 Years of Science in India, Progress of Anthropology and Archaeology in which he discussed the progress of anthropology in India with respect to prehistoric archaeology, cultural anthropology, and physical anthropology. L.P. Vidyarthi in 1965, I'm sorry, 1964, referred to the emergence of a new trend in Indian anthropology which was the study of the village, caste, religion, kinship, and emergence of the applied anthropology. So 1900 and 1964, it was L.P. Vidyarithi, which referred to the emergence of a new trends of Indian uh, anthropology. And uh, now, instead of the tribes, Alpi Vidyarthi studied about the villages, about the caste, about the religion, about the kinship, and the uh, and it and it resulted in the emergence of the applied anthropology. And so Jeet Sinha in 1968 in a conference observed that the direction that the Indian anthropology was taking was not so much as imitation of the best but rather to establish the Indian tradition in anthropology. So uh, Asuji uh, Sinha uh, advocated about a development about the establishment of the Indian tradition of the anthropology rather than imitating the tradition of the western anthropology. There are the various phases of Indian anthropology and we can divide uh, this into three phases basically. Uh, Vidyarthi and Sinha divided the growth of Indian anthropology into uh, four phases. Uh, four phases. The first phase is the formative phase that is from 1772 to 1990. The constructive phase 1922-49 and the evaluative period that is 1900 and onwards. 
what is the formative phase of Indian anthropology, which started in 1772 and uh, it, uh, till 1919. Anthropology in colonial India was mostly undertaken by the government in that sense that most people who undertook the work belonged to government or the Indian civil services. And few others were a part of the army. Some belonged to the medical, medical educational policy and other services. So this was a formative phase. And in India, uh, the Britishers started the anthropology. They started, uh, they started the census uh, in order uh, to rule India in a better way. They wanted to understand the ethnography or the uh, structure of the Indian society so that they can rule India in a better way. How they can rule India, how this could help them, right? So uh, it was um, during the informative phase that is the uh, that the anthropology uh, was um, uh, the studies were taken were taken by the government was undertaken by the government and. Uh, it um, basically um, uh, the anthropologist or the who studied about uh, the about the Indian people and the Indian culture they be linked either to the Indian civil services or uh, uh, army or other policy makers. So it was undertaken by the government. The study of anthropology in India began around the same time that the census of country was being taken around 1871 to 1872. So it was 71-72 uh, uh, when the first census was uh, started that the, this um, anthropology, the study of anthropology in, in India began. This exercise also reiterated the idea that the traditional society present in India was composed of number of separate castes, religious communities, which formed the core of the society along the tribes existed on the periphery. So, uh, according to uh, this study that um, uh, Indian society is composed of number of separate caste, number of separate religion communities, and uh, um, uh, and these caste and communities are are uh, then these form the core of the Indian society, and the tribes exists on the periphery. In the first attempt to provide a comprehensive anthropological data on caste and tribe was in the census 1901, which was led by the Rishli. So uh, we discussed about Rishli in our previous lectures. So in 1901, uh, the Rishli uh, provided the data in, uh, nine, uh, in 1901, the uh, census was carried out by the Rishli and it has given the comprehensive anthro anth anthropological uh, data on the caste and the tribes. And in these efforts, a lot of tribes who reside in the interior part of the country were brought into the focus. Before this, these tribes were not known because they were living interior parts of the country. They were brought into the focus. This continued even 1911, so much so that both these senses were largely considered as anthropological classics. So the census of 1901 and census of 1911 are considered as anthropological classes because it studied about the uh, caste religion tribes of India. In a similar way, in 1931, census was a very important milestone in ethnological studies as it formed the basis of classification of people of this subcontinent. So uh, the census of 1931 was the basis of the ethnological study because uh, this census was the basis of classification of people of this subcontinent. 
In the 19th century, the common belief among the anthropologists in India was that people has uh, descended either from the more advanced Aryans or the more indigenous and primitive uh, Dravidians. So it was a common belief that uh, we are the our, uh, our ancestors are either Aryans or uh, Dravidians. Uh, Rishle in his work discussed how division among the castes cannot only uh, be explained by the division of labor, but rather how it was hierarchical distinction between the fair-skinned Aryans who were at the higher uh, pedestal and the dark-skinned Dravidians who were at the lower pedestal. So, uh, Rishle, uh, who was appointed as a censor, who was appointed by the British um, government and he carried out a uh, census in 1901 and um, he uh, studied that the division of the caste uh, cannot only be explained on the basis of the labor what type of work they carry out but again it was on the basis of the hierarchical uh, distinction between the fair skinned aryan and the dark skinned dravidians uh, aryans uh, were at the higher pedestal than the dravidians his theory also supported by the anthropometrical measurements. While Crook, on the other hand, included anthropom uh, anthropomorphic data from the uh, northwestern provinces to show that the national indices varied only marginally among the castes and the tribe, and this it could not be taken as the basis of caste, which for him could only be found among occupation. So uh, according to Crook, it is only occupation, which is the basis of the caste, while according to uh, Rishle, it is not only the occupation, but the um, ancestral, but the, whether the, whether uh, uh, hierarchy, that is the, um, uh, Aryans and Dravidians are the two other um, uh, uh, hierarchical distinctions are the uh, basis of the caste division. So they differ. That is the crook. According to crook, occupation is this. And according to uh, uh, Rishle, not only occupation, but the hierarchical distinction also is important for the caste division. The next phase is the construct phase that is from 1920 to 1949 a new term came into ethnographical studies when the social anthropology was included as a subject in the curriculum of university in calcutta in 1920 in postgraduate syllabus so uh, in 1920, this anthropology was included as a subject in the curriculum in University of Calcutta. And this was a new term came into the ethnographic studies. This was the second phase of ethnographic studies or anthropological studies, that is the constructive phase. A work by Majumdar on the racial and ethnic surveys in Bengal, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, which was an important step in the study of physical and social anthropology. So uh, Majumdar played an important role. He carried out the uh, racial and ethnic surveys in Bengal, in Gujarat, in Uttar Pradesh. And these uh, studies and his studies, the studies of Majumdar, played an important step in the study of physical and the social anthropology. M. N. Srinivas work on marriage and family in Mysore is also important, played an important role in constructive phase. Right? It studied, he also studied about the physical and the social anthropology. M. N. Srinivas uh, work on the marriages and the family in uh, Mysore. And he has given the concept of uh, westernization, Sanskritizations. 
In 1945, the Anthropological Survey of India was established in India, which looked at the anthropometric study in different parts of the country and focused on the racial classification based on the ethnic differences. So in 1945, for the first time, the Anthropological Survey of India was established. And this survey, this Anthropological Survey of India looked into the anthropometric studies in the different parts of the country. And the, this, uh, is, this focused on the uh, racial classifications based on the ethnic differences. They uh, try to study about the, the uh, classifying the racial classification on the ethnic difference and they started studying about them. This was also a time period where, uh, when Wimmer Elwin published a number of books on the tribe people of Madhya Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh and Orissa which are seen as the classic within the field. We discussed about uh, Alvin in our previous lecture in detail. Um, he studied the tribes of the Madhya Pradesh. He tribes about the uh, uh, he tri tribes of the Arunachal Pradesh and the Orissa, and his work is seen as the classics within the field. His work is very important. The subject thus matured within this period and influenced by the British line of thought and works done eminent universities in Europe and Indian anthropologists too stated to look at the Indian anthropology from the different light and started to develop their own distinct study. So this was the formative period in which the anthropology became the part of the curriculum and it entered into the university and, the, and uh, thus this subject matured. And this was influenced by the British line of thought. So obviously it was uh, uh, influenced by the British lines of thought and uh, he, it, this was influenced by the eminent work of the universities in Europe because uh, 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 many important studies were carried out here in Europe and the Indian anthropology too started looking at the Indian anthropology from a different uh, perspective from the different light. So this period was influenced by the Western Europe. It was influenced by the Britishers as well as Indian anthropologists um, started looking at a different lights at a different perspective. So this was the formative phase. And the next phase was the analytical period. And the analytical period is from 1950 to 1990. Analytical uh, period post the Second World War and the Indian independence, in addition to British line of thoughts, an American style of anthropology was also seen. We were influenced by the uh, British lines of thoughts in uh, India, but again, the American style of anthropology was also important. It was also seen. And to understanding of Indian pre-literate, isolate society, one that had been influenced of the British thought was replaced during the period with more emphasis on inward thoughts and study of India as a complex society emerged with the idea of a village society gaining much traction. It was a period of it was an analytical period. We were influenced by the British uh, line, British thought of line. But again, during the formative phase, uh, we, although we were influenced by the British thought, but Indian anthropologists started taking their line. And uh, then again, the American style of anthropology also influenced us. And... Um, 
the under under understanding of the india as a pre literate isolated society because uh, britishers considered as the pre literate isolated society which needed to be studied which needed to be explored uh, uh, it was in the thought it was this thought that the india is a pre literate and the isolated society is replaced uh, during this period during the analytical period and during this period emphasis uh, was given on the thoughts and the study of india as a complex society so during this period the thought has emerged that india is not a pre literate isolated society it is a complex society so emphasis is laid on this that india is a, uh, during this period that india is a society complex uh, society and uh, the studies were carried out in the uh, on the basis of uh, on the villages rather than the uh, uh, tribes uh, before this uh, before this period basically uh, anthropological studies were carried out on the tribes now uh, this vision has shifted from tribes to the villages and now rather than treating the india as a pre literate and isolated society people uh, this uh, anthropologist uh, started thinking that india is a complex society and the idea shifted from tribes to the village study and this village study has gained more traction that's how the uh, the work in 1955 by american anthropologist mac kim marriot titled village india studied in the little community is one of the great significance of the indian anthropology so um, uh, the american anthro as we were influenced by the american also studied about american anthropologist also studied about the indian society and in 1955 uh mac kim marriot studied about the indian villages and and his work that is titled the village india and he studied the little studied in the little community according to him the village is a little community is one of the great significance in the indian anthropology in india the shift was observed from more of tribal studies to now where the emphasis was more on the study of indian civilization from the grassroots level that is uh, the uh, shift over, that is uh, from uh, tribal studies now shift uh, there was a shift from the tri study of tribal studies to the uh, village studies now uh, there is now people started uh, uh, studying about the uh, villages or the uh, indian civilization from the grass root indian anthropologist like d n majumdar m n shrinivas and s c dubey were the important figures in the study of community and village studies m n shrinivas studied about the uh, studies about the villages in mysore d n majumdar studied about the villages s c dubey's work is important he studied about the villages and uh, they are important figure about the community and village studies not just influenced by the british and american anthropologist but even french structuralist such as levi strauss and dumont and leech influenced the study of kinship and caste respectively so uh, uh that is uh, the british and uh, uh, british and american anthropologist study about the india apart from this the french structuralist also influenced or study about the indian society and few uh, uh, important french structuralist like uh, levi strauss uh, dumont and leech they uh, study about the kinship they study about the kinship and the caste system of india in the late 20th century around 1980s and 90s the understanding of anthropology underwent a drastic change the change was a result of reaction to the caste studies 
that was popularized by the structural functionalist approach by Louis Dumont, Dumont in 1960s and 70s. So uh, I'm Britishers, American, and the French structuralists uh, uh, an important role in Indian anthropology. And in the late 20th century, that is around 1980s and 90s, uh, this uh, understanding of anthropology underwent a drastic change. Why and how it underwent a drastic change? It was a result of the reaction to the caste studies. From the shift was from tribal to the village, from village to this caste. It, there was a reaction to the caste studies, and these caste studies were popularized by the structural functionalist approach. This caste was approached by the Louis Dumont in 1960s and the 70s. Uh, the French, uh, French anthropologist uh, Dumont studied about the caste system of the India and now from villages, the studies and the uh, this. Um, uh, uh, the people started now started uh, uh, studying about the caste system, right, of India. From uh, the shift is from tribal to villages to the caste studies. So, uh, in 1980s and 90s, there was a drastic change in the anthropology, and it was because of the reaction to the caste studies, and which was in it was popularized by the structural functionalist. Louis Dumont in 1960s and uh, 70s. Dumont famous did he studied about the he studied about the caste in Indian society. The decline from the village studies model was what allowed Indian anthropology to break out of the mold of caste and move to the larger structure within Indian settings such as class, religion, and so on. So, um, from uh, village studies model to, uh, uh, to the studies about the classes, religions, and so on. From so, so now you can see the shift. Shift is from tribes to villages to the caste to uh, class, religion, and so on. So there was a change in this analytical phase. The people studied about the villages, they studied about the caste, they studied about the kinship. Now they started uh, studying about the classes, about the religion, and many other uh, aspects of the Indian society. Understanding of a great and a little traditions defined by the Robert Redfield, social and economic basis of Indian society, that is by Leach and Boss, the study of caste as a system of stratification by Srinivas among gave rise to a plethora of perspective and helped discipline expand, uh, expand leaps and bounds. So uh, uh, Robert Redfield has given the uh, concept of great and the little tradition. Uh, then uh, from uh, great and little tradition to social and economic basis of the Indian society, that is the M.K. Bose, Leach, and K. God studied about the social and economic basis of the Indian society. Uh, then uh, M. N. Srinivas studied about the caste as a system of stratification, how caste plays an important role in stratifying the Indian society. And there are n numbers of studies carried out which help to uh, expand the anthropological or this uh, anthropology or the ethnography discipline from the leaps and bounds. Post-independence, the spirit of nationalism was strong among Indian scholars, which also led to creation of multiplicity of indigenous approaches to study the society. M.C. Bose developed a model to look at the process of modernization for tribes and costs. So N.C. Bose uh, developed uh, a post-independence, N.C. Bose developed a model, how can we modernize the tribes and the castes? 
S.C. Dubey looked at the Indian civilization through a six-fold classification of tradition, that is the classical, national, regional, local, western, local, subcultural tradition and of social growth. Iravati Karve tried to explain the Indian civilization on the basis of historical, linguistic, structural and cultural variables. The uh, studies of Karve on the kinships are very important and she tried to uh, explain the Indian civilization on the basis of historical, linguistic, structural and cultural variables. Uh, Burman, then B.K. Burman, tried to understand the India in terms of socio-political process and developed a concept of notion and of nation and some nation. Amin Srinivas came up with the mobility model to understand the social change. So Jeet Sinha uh, posted tribes and caste at the two opposite continent and in order to understand the social structure of the Indian society. So Surjit Sinha uh, posted the tribes and caste at the two opposite uh, continuum. And, you know, and, and why he posted it on the two opposite continuum in order to understand the social structure of Indian society. And that's all for today. Thank you very much. Namaskar.